Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. My name is Julio Reina Farge. I am here with the Global Summits Institute, and I'm very happy to say, first of all, happy Father's Day to all doctors around the world. And uh, today we're going to have, <clears throat> I'm honored to have Dr. Banerjee with us and we are going to talk a little bit about endodontics. But before I, I introduce you to Dr. Banerjee, I would like to tell you that we are very happy because we are launching our scholarships for the DHP. The Global Summits Institute is working with the Universal School of Health and we are launching this DHP program there and we are having scholarships and it's going to work for every a, a, every continent around the world. So if you want more information our, our, for our DHB uh, uh, scholarships and our DHB program, please refer to our universalschoolofhealth.com. That is, that is our uh, webpage and you can ask for information about our program. It's a very nice program. We're gonna have more that, than 500 hours of lectures and also um, with doctors all around the world, the best minds that we have in our, in our careers in health, in healthcare industry and in healthcare business. And it's gonna be a very, very good program. Our program is already, <coughs> it has a seal of acceptance of the, the HEX commission that, and, and we are gonna be, a, 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 we, we have uh, the Universal School of Health behind all these kind of DHPs and all the programs that we are preparing for you. So I'm very, very happy to introduce you to that. We also have for these courses some CE credits. You will find it in the comment, in the comment part and the comment, in the comment section of the Facebook. So if you want your CE, your CE credits, please refer to that. And please be, uh, I'm be very happy to, to uh, join you at the DHP that we are launching. We are having some several lectures also with some of the professors and the faculty that we're gonna have in our DHP. So I'm very happy to be with you. And also I would like to say that uh, we are honored to have one of our top 100 doctors over here. He is Dr. Saurabh Banerjee. Dr. Saurabh Banerjee is an endodontist and he is a practicing uh, microendodontist. And uh, he uh, obtained his uh, BDS with honors. And he's also a master of science in medical microbiology. And he uh, used to lecture you know, uh, for the Shah Dental College in Badodara and he owns a practice in Omkarananda Dental Care and, <clears throat> and do some research at Vistapur, uh, Jamsejulpur. Um, we're very happy, very honored to have him. And he is also a lecturer for many brands as Kavokir in India and many other ones. Dr. Banerjee, thank you very much for being with us. I'm very, very happy to introduce you in your lecture. So please tell us and tell your audience right now, uh, how do you start with your, uh, to, uh, your interest in um, micro endodontics? Uh, thank you, Dr. Julio, for that uh, wonderful and detailed uh, introduction. So, uh, I started uh, a passion like you see, uh, endodontics is all about saving the tooth and alleviating the pain. So I developed uh, actually uh, I developed an interest in uh, uh, doing endodontic work. And endodontics is uh, not much means if you don't use magnification and microscopes, endodontics has very limited role. So slowly I was drawn into magnifications using magnification in my. Uh, this is one of the only clinic at my city and even in this entire, entire uh, Eastern India region that has started uh, doing root canals under microscope. And since last 10 years, uh, we are working here and I'm very passionate about uh, my speciality and it's, it's all goes like that. 
Okay, wonderful. As I told you before, in the backstage, my father was also, he was an endodontist. And I'm very honored to have another endodontist mm -hmm. over here in our program that we are doing this all these weekends with the Global Summit Institute. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, what do you tell, uh, what, what you're going to talk about this time in, in this, in this webinar? Um, we'll be discussing about uh, uh, the mishap of having a separated instrument or a broken instrument in a root canal treatment. Doing anodontic uh, treatment is a very uh, common affair, and uh, it like it perplexes the clinician. Like what to do once the uh, file is fractured in the canal? Like what should be the next step? Should we retain it? Should we retrieve it? Should we, like, what should we do? And what are all the sequelae of making that decision? Like, what to do? So today's presentation is all about that, like, how to come to a decision to manage a fractured instrument and endorontic canal. So what all uh, factors we should consider uh, when we are dealing with a mishap like that? So the presentation uh, encompasses all those things. Yeah, that's that's very common in, in an adultist uh, where they have a very different canals and very tough canals sometimes and the instruments yeah. don't work that the way that we want. So sometimes it get broken and it's very, very hard to take them out. And that's a problem that I usually see in many, many of the endodontists that, I, that they work for me and, uh, and for us. And Thank you very much for being here. I will let you uh, to do your presentations. Please uh, um, don't forget, uh, doctors, please don't forget that you can get your secrets for this wonderful course in the comment section in the Facebook. Thank you, Dr. Bacardi. I'll let you uh, do your presentation. Sure, thank you. Please, you can share your, your screen. So, should we start? Yeah, it looks great. It um, looks fun. Yeah. So good evening and good morning to all my colleagues and friends across the globe. So the time is such that somewhere it will be a morning, somewhere it will be evening. So uh, I just uh, reach out to all with this presentation of mine today. So as I briefed out, it's about management of separated instruments in root canal treatment and the strategic decision making. So when a, a file fractures in a canal, it's really a frustrating experience. So we'll be discussing about it. So I welcome you all from the steel city of India, Jamshedpur. So it's a famous city in India, a beautiful city that houses the uh, famous steel plant, the Tata steel plant. And I'm proud to be from uh, that city. So we'll have a roadmap of uh, today's presentation. Uh, like uh, we'll see some background like regarding, uh, we'll have a background of uh, about the discussion of a separated instruments, influence of separated instruments, uh, how it, the etiology of file fracture, the decision making, what to do and how to mitigate it, the preventing file failure, medical legal aspects and we'll see some cases. So the background is, uh, since we have started doing root canal treatments, endodontics, so as old as the mishap of a file, fractured file in a canal. So the stainless steel files also fractured and now the night eye systems that has introduced in the late 90s, early and late 90s do fracture. But the perception of the fracture is more uh, recently as because when you have a greater tip of file, so when it fractures, you immediately come to know. A small file, if one or two fluid fractures, it is not that conspicuous. Second, the improvement in radiology, that is uh, digital imaging has uh, like improved the visibility, 
though with nata instruments the fracture rate is quite low that is 0.4 to 5% only but again the tendency of the clinicians to do good cases and post it on social media share with their peer based uh, groups has motivated them to show good filled canals nobody would like to have a file uh, fractured in the canal that comes on the uh, in the x ray so these all things have popularized to remove a uh, remove a file from the canal and uh, like how to mitigate if it has to be there now first we have to see like uh, what all things makes for a successful anaerobic case so it comprises of a triad that is shaping and cleaning then you have disinfection of the canals and you have a hermetic seal with a 3d obturation so these are the fundamentals that go for a successful endodontic treatment so if those triad is the basis of a successful treatment does a separated file really influences a case so the answer is no actually uh, a separated file doesn't directly affect uh, the outcome of the case then how does it affects and why it is so important to manage it so cases fail when we uh, fail to attain the objective and the primary goals of an anaerobic treatment and this all happens as because a separated file acts as an impediment in the canal like all other impediments in the canal separated file also acts as an impediment so before we go into uh, like the decision making what to do with a fractured file or separated file in the canal we have to do a thorough diagnosis of that separated file so the basic thing we know whenever something happens a mishap happens our basic tendency as a clinicians to go for a iopar that is very handy we have it in our clinics and we have good uh, digital uh, options nowadays so what we see we have a curvature of the canal we see the length of the separated file that is uh, that is separated and we can see the periapical status also but in many cases only a iopar will not be enough so in some cases you need a more detailed view of a 3d image of the canal so in that cases we have to go for a cbct and the cbct is especially useful when the file has fractured deeper in the canal or beyond the visible range of your microscope also cbct helps uh, to see the axial images that helps us to identify the thicker portion of the canals when we are dealing with anterior or straighter canals and the inner portion of the canal that is very important so unless we we'll view the inner portion of the canal or the inner wall of the curvature we can't retrieve it uh, like safely so all these things also the detailed picture of the periapical lesion is also evident with a cbct now once we have done the diagnosis now the decision making comes so when we are uh, discussing about the decision making the most important thing that has to be considered is at what a stage the file has separated during the process of the endodontic treatment and second what is the periapical condition of the tooth so these two things are very important so suppose we have a separated instrument in the canal so what could be the possibilities first possibility could be the file could be partially beyond the root canal in that case what is the option we have to go for a surgery there is no other option second if the file is within the canal so then what could be other possibilities there could be no periapical lesion or there could be a periapical lesion so when there is no periapical lesion we have to attempt bypass so that is uh, that is a standard protocol second when we have a periapical lesion then also the first step is attempting a bypass why it is so we'll discuss in the later part of the discussion then we have suppose when we attempt bypass there could be two possibilities either we can bypass it and we can adequately shape the canal so that uh, irrigation and obturation all those disinfection could be done achieved and done suppose it is not possible then what to do 
then we have to do a retrieval. If you bypass and you cannot achieve the endodontic goals, again, you have to restore to retrieval. And in some cases where there is obvious periapical lesion and you discrelic and discretion is that you have to go for a retrieval. So directly you can go for a retrieval. So this is a basic flow chart, like how we should go for that decision making. So first we'll discuss about bypassing. Bypassing is always the first uh, step that you, uh, like the first approach. Why? It is conservative. It is conservative. It needs lesser cumbersome instruments that is there, but it has few limitations also. We'll, we'll go into that detail. So when you are bypassing an instrument, you have to know the length of the instrument, the location of the instrument, the design, size, taper, all these criteria of the instrument has to be considered. Now, the most important factor that goes, uh, like when you are uh, deciding to bypass, like what, uh, what design of file have you fractured? Like the files, we know we have two kinds of files. We have a landed file and non-landed file. So landed files look like this. You have wide lands. You can just follow the, uh, the arrowhead that I'm taking across the image. You can see the land, wide lands. So these lands contact the walls of the canal and it is complete. It is very difficult to put any file uh, to bypass it in that. Second option is you have the non-landed files. So you can see here, there are no lands. So this is the basic difference between a landed file and a non-landed file. Also, you can see this image, the triangle image on the right end corner of your screen. You can see a lot of space between the file and the canal wall. Whereas in this one, on the left side of the image, you can see very less space. So because of this space, bypassing is quite difficult in landed files, where it is relatively easy in non-landed files. There are definitely other factors to be considered, like suppose you fracture a very short length landed file that could be easily bypassed compared to a long length uh, non-landed file. So those permutation combinations are definitely there, but in a gross way, landed files are difficult to bypass compared to non-landed files. Then we have the length. Obviously, the longer the length, it is difficult to bypass. Location. Suppose the file is quite up in the canal, in the coronal part, middle third, before the curvature, all those situations, it is relatively easy to bypass. But if as deep in the canal, it becomes difficult. Size, what size file you have fractured, the ISO size we talk about. Suppose a 50 number file will be easily bypassed compared to a 30 or 35 number file. So it's obvious. Then you have the tapo. If you fracture a greater tapo file, obviously it will be difficult than a small tapered file, like a 2% file. So these are all the considerations we have to do when we are dealing with bypassing. Now, what is the protocol of bypassing? First, what do we do? We widen the canal till the coronal end of the file with a one or two number GG drill, depending on the curvature of the canal. Then we soak the canal with EDTA for 30 seconds. And after that 30 seconds activation with ultrasonics. Then with the small files like six, eight and 10 with small bends, uh, for example, one or two bends uh, of the flute at the tip of the file, about approximately a 45 degree angle, we start negotiating the canal and searching for a gap between the file and the canal wall where you can just put your file and your file sinks down. We have to search for that catch. So one important thing, when you are using the small files, 6, 8, 10, and files, it is very important to use a wiggling motion. Now, what is wiggling motion? It is short to and fro, clockwise and anti-clockwise motion. We should not use constant rotations with these size files. They are not designed to take a constant rotation. You have to use a short, less than, say, 45, 50 degrees, to and fro, wiggling motion, so that just, it's like that, uh, like you are searching some way into. So that is very important. And you can see the file here, how it 
actually when it negates you can see this the shape of the file becomes like that. and it's very important when you pull out that file you need to discard it so otherwise secondary fractures of these files may happen and it may complicate the case now once you have perceived that catch in the canal it is very important to align your uh, the marker on the stopper you have a marker black marker on the stopper always so you have to align some coronal reference point you have to align the marker to that so that the curvature is on that direction so when you put the next file you don't have to again search for it you just align it put it it will easily go and you sequentially go on enlarging the thing now by now we have obviously understood that bypassing is predominantly a game of hand files tactile perception and a lot of patience so it's important to uh, note that the most engagement of whatever file has fractured is on the coronal part it is more obvious with the greater type of files so once you pass that say a few um, millimeters less than a millimeter of that coronal aspect rest of the file the pikel of the file is mostly free in the canal this is very important so once you bypass the file segment immediately you have to attach your uh, electronic apex locator as because you have to prevent any uh, uh, any widening untoward widening of your uh, physiologic apex so as soon as you feel that you have negated the by a uh, file the separated file you attach your apex locators and proceed further so once you have uh, gone till the working length the next step is very important you have to sequentially enlarge the canal up to at least 34 size 32 or 34 size that is 304 size so that this basic size is very important to do any good amount of uh cleaning shaping disinfection and irrigant activation if you want to do obviously if you want to do a good obturation also you need some space there so if you can't achieve this basic size then your bypass is not enough so not meeting the endodontic triad is a limitation of bypass this is very fundamental just bypassing with a small file is not enough if you can't achieve the endodontic goal that is a proper disinfection proper irrigant activation and a good hermetic 3d obturation these things if can be achieved then bypassing it's not actually technically viable so now we come to our second point that is retrieval now when it comes to retrieval we have to see that there are three approaches one is an orthograde approach that is you approach the same way as you have done the root canal treatment previously second is a retrograde approach that is basically a surgical approach when the file is obviously out or quite some amount of the file is out of the uh, canal and third is a combination of orthograde and a retrograde approach where sometimes you feel that uh, going for the retrieval of the file ortho uh, by orthograde approach may sacrifice a lot of bending so in that case what you do you just use your ultrasonic tips to push the file beyond and you surgically retrieve the file so this is some special cases uh, very rare cases though so these are the three approaches that you can go for now the author we need to talk about the orthograde auto approach <coughs> excuse me so it is most widely uh, employed approach and it has gone a lot amount of evolution lot amount of different uh equipments materials techniques has been evolved but now the mainstay is the ultrasonic technique under magnification that is your dental operating microscope or the dom basically because ultrasonic technique is the most precise and conservative approach and very predictable too under dom especially but when you have to you go for ultrasonic technique retrieval you have to have mastery over the use of dental operating microscope as because sometimes you have to work at a magnification of more than 25 to 30 so it is not easy to focus at that high magnification and in that depth of field so you have to have a good hand eye mirror mouth mirror coordination that is the basic prerequisite 
Also, if the separated instrument is visible in the canal on the first go with your microscope, it's considered to be an easy case. Contrary to that, if it is not visible on the first go, it is a difficult case. <clears throat> so how we start with the retrieval process? Again, we have to take the IOPAR and in specific cases, you have to go for a CDCT. But again, the basic things are the same. You have to see the length of the separated instrument. It is very important in this case also, you have to see the curvature of the canal. So how much curved is the canal? More the curved of canal, so difficulty of the case will go high. Usually 15, 20 degrees more the curvature, it is considered to be a more uh, difficult case. Then identifying the inner wall of the curved canal is a very important thing and that can be only done with your CBCT. And identify the thickest portion of the canal in case of straighter and anterior T. So that is the role of the diagnosis. Then we'll see the protocol, what we do. The first step is you use a two or three number GG drill to widen the canal till the coronal part of the separated instrument. This is to increase visibility. Then what we do is we flood the canal with EDTA. We let it soak for 30 seconds, activate it, put some fresh fluid. And then what we do, we use a, a customized tip like this, that is like a chisel shape cutting on the sides. And you use a piezoelectric activation of ultrasonics, that is piezoelectric vibrates on the sides. So what we do is we place this chisel shape against the file and, the, and this, uh, what do you call the canal wall. You can see my arrowhead on this uh, schematic diagram. The red thing is the cutting that is being done with your ultrasonic tip. The green star that you see is presumably a file and the yellow is your canal. So that 180 degree cutting you do with this chisel to about two millimeters deep. While doing this process, the power should be at low and the canal should be soaked in fluid. These are the two important criteria that you have to follow. And you see here in this image, sorry, uh, the same image here also, you can see this image, how the ultrasonic tip is just aligned at the inner wall. And this is the, uh, the, the coronal end of the file you can see and how it is adapted on the inner wall. So this is very, very important. So the ultrasonic tips that you use, you have to customize them according to your, your use. Now, that forms the previous, that I said the preference of two millimeter of two millimeter deep and 180 degree semicircular gutter. You follow the second, that is, this comes the second step where we use a pointed tip like this. So what we do, we place this pointed tip into that gutter and we activate it. Now this activation will be at a higher power. The canal will be filled with uh, fluid and the activation power will be higher. But you have to see that the ultrasonic tip doesn't actually touch the file. You should be free in the canal between the wall and the file and you should do an up and down motion while activating. Now what is the importance of this? The acoustic streaming that will happen inside and with the help of that ultrasonic energy, it will free the file and it will disengage it from the dentine that is being binded. So the third step is inspection. What you do is inspection and inspection should always be done in a dry canal. You have to aspirate the fluids, wash it, clean it, and you have to visualize like you have prepared the inner wall efficiently or not. And what is the status of the file? You take you know, like thin instruments like GG Pro, DG Pro, DG16 Pro, that also you can customize by, uh, customize it by trimming and uh, grinding. So make them thin and curved. And what you do is you check with that DG Pro, you check the segment. Now, if the segment is flexing, flexing means well, suppose this is a DG, you flex it, it come back again. You flex it, it comes back again. So this is flexion. So when you push it, it goes to a point and then it again comes back. So that is flexion. 
So flexion means the file is not free from the dentine. It needs more uh, activations to free it. Now, what will happen? If it is flexing and you do the high power ultrasonic activation, it will actually do the secondary fracture of the file. So it is very important. You have to check with your DG16 whether it is flexing or not. So if it is flexing, then what you should do? You should prepare, widen the gutter more and ultrasonic activation should be done without touching the file more so that it freeze, freeze and come up in the canal. The second scenario could be the file could be moving and shifting. For example, this is the file. You touch with the DG, it shifts and it stays there. When you touch it again, it comes back. When you touch it again, it goes there. Again, it comes back. So that is moving and shifting. That means it has got disengaged. So when you see that the file is disengaged, your step four starts. So what you do is, you start the retrieval process. You see the file is dancing. So at the process of moving and shifting, you do some amount of ultrasonic activation and the file comes up in the canal and it is almost dancing in the canal. It's completely free in the canal. You can feel it with the DG Pro under magnification. So then comes the retrieval process. Now in retrieval, what you do is, again, you use a pointed ultrasonic tip flooded canal with activation. Now this activation of the fluid will form an acoustic streaming and you move the tip up and down. That acoustic streaming energy will push the file up in the canal. will push the file up in the canal. And in many cases, you will see that that activation along with some irrigation will pop up the file out of the canal. It happens mostly. Suppose the popping doesn't happen in very long files, the popping doesn't happen actually when the segment is very long. In some cases, you may need a loop device to engage the file and pull it out. Now we'll see a few uh, clinical cases. So this is uh, one of the case you can see, it was referred to me. Patient came with asymptomatic uh, irreversible pulpitis uh, with a fractured file. Actually, the patient was immediately after the fracture, the patient was uh, referred to me with this file, a 7.5 millimeter file you can see here that was lodged in the canal and you can make out this curvature of the canal. They were narrow canals and quite curved. So what we did is when we actually bypassed the case, we saw that canals were 23 millimeter long and the, sec the separated file was three millimeters short from the radiograph, sorry, electronic apex. So what we did is we did a decision-making evaluation here. So under the microscope, you can see this orange line. So this orange line is quite away from the tip of the segment uh, separated file. It was, it, was, it was not visible. So Second, what we did, we estimated the curvature. It was the green line, green dotted line you can follow. That is almost 40 degrees of curvature. And third thing, what we realized that if we want to make this segment visible under microscope, we have to trim down this complete inner wall of the canal. That is this zone between these two dotted red lines. So a lot amount of dentin, just if you can, uh, go back to the previous image, you, you could make out narrow canals having good amount of curvature. So just imagine how much of dentine has to be sacrificed in this uh, uh, furcal area. Furcal area is considered to be a critical area. So this was the case. Now, what, how we decided though, um, it was decided to bypass as because the canal didn't show any gross pathology. There were no subjective symptoms. The patient was fine. So all things we decided to go for bypass. But when we are going for bypass, the thing that we bear in mind is we have to be able to create enough size adjust in the file so that we can do irrigation, activation, and obturation. So that is always there. So what we did is here you can see we could bypass it with a small file easily. 
and sequentially we enlarged it to a bigger file. So we could easily prepare 3004 size in spite of this segment there. So when we can prepare 30 zero size, our 20, 30 gauge needle, irrigation needle, segmented needle can easily go beside that and you can do irrigation in the apical part that is the comprises the uh, disinfection part also and we can do a good obturation also. So that is the basic prerequisite. If we can't go for this size, then suppose I could just bypass with a 1502 or maybe 1504, that is not enough. That is not enough. We have to go for a size which is recommended where we can take our irrigation needles till the working length. And this is the finished case. Now, one good thing that you can see in this finished case is you can hardly make out the file between the obturation. Though it is a digital image, you cannot make that hardly. So this is a major factor before uh, like why people used to skip away without addressing the issue. But now with digital images, it is visible. In, even in this is a digital image, it is hardly visible. You see the file is completely included in the obturation and we can see for some amount of uh, extruded sealer, which is actually not desirable though, but that confirms patency. So if the sealer could go there, that means we could have, we do have a good patency. And for your information, this was a bioceramic sealer. So though anything beyond the canal is not recommended, if it is a bioceramic material, at least it is more biocompatible. So the second case, the case came to me, was referred to me with severe sensitivity. Now we can see two files fractured there, one in the MB canal and one in the palatal canal two files fracture and the MB was quite long. This case is a very old case of mine. And uh, so what we did is, you can see the curvature. Wow, something quite interesting. So now when we did the assessment, curve assessment, the MB canal showed 50 degrees curvature. Mind it, when we talk about retrieval and all, we say that 15, 20 degrees, anything more than 15, 20 degrees is a big one. So it was 50 degrees curvature. The ML canal had a 75 degree curvature. So anyway, we decided to again bypass as because there was a severe curvature, even this was a seven number tooth. This was a seven number tooth and there was a reduced mouth opening. But by all things, the patient was just having sensitivity. There was no apical periodontitis. The, the teeth was uh, uh, non-symptomatic on percussion. So all those things, radiographically also, we didn't make out any gross uh, uh, periapical pathosis. So all this favored a bypass and we attempted bypass. Now we see here, by God's grace, we could achieve 30-04 or more size in all the canals. Palatal uh, distal was even more. MB, ML, we could, and you can see here the file and it is bypassed. You can easily make out the, uh, this cyan color, uh, uh, this arrows you can make out. So it was uh, uh, bypassed and we could achieve the endodontic triad goal. That is basic. That is a biologic uh, consideration of endodontics could be achieved. And this case, this is a finished image that you can see here. And this case is amazing. Just we have a six years, wonderful follow-up. So this is in 2015. And here you can see two images, uh, 2021, two different angulations. And you can just see this fractured file incorporated in the obturation there and beautiful apical area, nothing. The patient is completely asymptomatic, totally functional teeth. So here we can take home message that if your biologic objectives are attained, fractured instrument is not detrimental to the success of the case, okay? It is just an impediment. So if you can bypass the impediment, attain the biologic goals, it's enough. Now we see another case here. So the case came with a fractured file 
there in the mesial canal <clears throat> the patient was quite excuse me the patient was quite symptomatic a uh, lot of apical periodontitis spontaneous pain and you can see the file here though this was not a very difficult case in relation to retrieval uh, it could in under basic 10 magnification we could make out the file there in the canal so it was decided to retrieve this is after guttering on the inner wall and this is the file loosened file that rise up in the canal and here we see the file is removed so not much destruction of that uh, area so here you see so you can make out the file now this is a very important take home message whenever you are doing retrievals for tiny pieces or any kind of segments do not to close all other orifices with anything either a sterilized teflon tape or cotton or even thermoplasticized gutta percha that is very important what may happen is the file comes out most of the time the file comes out with ultrasonic activation with irrigation and it comes it pops out of the canal so it pops out it may drop into some other orifice it may complicate your case so always block this this white thing that you see a teflon teflon packed in that area so you can see the file that has just come now just popped out because of irrigation activation and here is the segment so this is the case this was the file you see no gross destruction of the dentin there though it was near to the furcal area uh, area considered to be critical and when you compare the two canals that is the mb and ml both are almost of the same size so no much uh, invasive in that case so ultrasonic technique of retrieval is really really uh, conservative <clears throat> now this is another case uh, you can see this was a quite complicated case uh, in case referred to me uh, by an endodontist uh, so he attempted a uh, retrieval and uh, um, he actually perforated the canal he was doing it under loops so he perforated the canal and you can see in the cbct image the perforation you can follow my uh, this arrowhead there so this is a separated file there and this is the perforation and the first image that was sent to me by the referring dentist the top right corner image and you can see there uh, the file uh, is lodged there now now here you can see this the file now it was actually perforated now here after the removal of the broken file you can see some amount of uh, perforation you can make out though not much clear so when we enlarge it we can see this perforation there on the outer root area and here in this one you can make out more clearly when the at the gutta percha from the adjacent canal is also removed so you can make out this this is the perforation okay so this was quite a complicated case now here you see this in this image uh, when i started the case this was at this stage you can see the file there on the inner part of the curve and this is the perforation you can make out the perforation there so how we dealt with it the file was loosened and it came up the canal with ultrasonic activation and this is the retrieved file almost 6 mm length almost 6 mm length and in some cases you need this basic instrument so when a file falls off in the chamber or at the orifice you can hold them with the stiglet forceps and you can easily take them out never think that your tweezers will be working in the uh, inside the chamber it not, it never works so you have to have this now this is the second part of the case now when we retrieve the file we have to clean and shape that was again complicated because of that perforation so you can see this we have placed a small file curving inward it's going inward like this and here you can make out the perforation so after like when we shaped this is the master file fit x ray you can see there you can see the faint uh, perforation there and this is after the cone fit 
and this is following uh, dressing of calcium hydroxide as because the case was you have a large lesion there you can see this lesion you have a large lesion in the mesial root so it was decided to retrieve and we the patient was quite symptomatic uh, so we decided to even the patient has a swelling on the buccal vestibule so we decided to give a calcium hydroxide dressing so <clears throat> now this is the part of the obturation part. You can see the perforation there. And this is, now what happened, this case was actually converted uh, atrogenically into a vertusi class five. Vertusi class fives are having splits in the canal. You have a V-like split in the canal. So it has become like that. At the mid root level, there was a perforation on the outer curve of the uh, file. And this is why it is very important to work under high magnification and you have to identify the inner wall of the curve. Otherwise, these kind of mishaps are very common. You drill on the outer wall and you just land up in perforation. So what we did, we obturated this one with bioceramics. Then we obturated, uh, filled the, mis, uh, the perforations with bioceramic and finally filled the canal. You see, we filled the bioceramic Finally, we filled the canal with plasticized, thermoplasticized gutta perca. And this is till the orifice. We have to leave about 2 mm from the orifice deep to create uh, what you call the restorative plugs, composite plugs for good, this thing. And this is the final uh, chamber that you can see. You see, not much uh, difference in size, though a bit larger, but not very invasive. And we have used uh, bioceramic in this case. And here, I follow this protocol always. I seal the orifices with a colored composite. So that is what I call a window of opportunity. Now, suppose the case fails again, and it comes back to me, and I have restored this with a tooth colored composite. It becomes a hell of a time, frustrating time to search for the orifices. So as soon as I remove the tooth killer restoration, I can make out this blue marks and I can selectively drill there and I can search the canals very easily. It takes few minutes. So it's a good way to seal the orifices with a different colored composite. So always you leave a window of opportunity open. Should the teeth need a retreatment, it becomes quite easy. Now, this is the case. You can see here the amount of perforation that was created in the midroot level. So this is just the post-op. You can see all the bioceramic that has flowed out here while doing the obturation. And this was the canal that was perforated. It was actually not needed. I should have worked in this inner wall. Actually, while retrieving the file, I worked on the inner wall, but it was damaged previously here. So you can see that. And this is with the crown. We have another angulation there. You can see. You can beautifully make out a ring-like thing going between the bioceramic is flowing all through there. So this was the case. Another case, uh, this was a case with a fractured file in the apical region, and it had a big uh, periapical radiolucency there. We had two options. First is always bypass, as because this was in the apical region, we thought of bypassing, but again, we the thing was there in my our mind that, if we cannot achieve the biologic goal, then we have to think about retrieval also. So the plan, first plan, second plan was always there. So we started it. And you can see here the file there lodged and a big periapical uh, radiolucency there. So the file was bypassed initially easily, but we could see that we are unable to create bigger sizes. We are unable to create bigger sizes. Our bigger files were not going, and uh, we are seeing that the biologic goals will be compromised. So what we did, we went for retrieval. And here you can see, in this case, I have blocked the canals with thermoplasticized gutta perca. And after retrieval, the file has risen up. The file has risen up in the canal, almost at the orifice level. Here you can see the file. Just by activation and irrigation, the file has risen up. And this is the file that flown out of the canal. So we have retrieved the file from the topical region. So evidence says that 
teeth with preoperative lesions were significantly less likely to heal than those without a lesion when separated instrument was retained. So periapical lesion is a big consideration. We have evidence on that. Healing rate is also reduced in the presence of periapical periodontitis. So in those cases, if we can achieve bigger sizes, as in one previous case we have seen, we could achieve bigger size, everything heals. But if it, uh, it cannot create bigger sizes, we have to restore to removal. Now, this was basically a radiographically guided instrument retrieval. As because you can see this, the file was not visible. It was in the pical region. And this is the line of vision with the microscope. This was the file completely out of vision. In another view of the CBCT image, you can see the image is going. This is the inner curve and your file lies here. Just imagine, this is the canal. It goes like that and your file is lying in the pical region almost. So here we did the analysis and we saw that this much amount of the inner wall has to be taken out if we want to pull out that file. So it was there. You can follow the yellow dotted lines. And finally, the file is retrieved. In the image, you can compare, the file is retrieved and this is the post of images. So this was more a uh, radiologically guided instrument retrieval. In the axial view, we see the inner wall of the, uh, of the, of the tooth and we adapt our instruments, we modify, customize the instruments to just work at that length. So in this case, CBCT is a must. You cannot do without a CBCT in such cases. So what armamentarium uh, we need? So I'll just focus on the basic armamentariums. You need uh, ultrasonic tips. You can customize them, chisel like for 180 degree cutting. So when you're planning retrieval, you need two basic tips, one tip for side cutting for 180 degree gutter preparation and another fine tip for activating it and pulling the file out. So these are the basic ultrasonic tips that you can use for. This one basic forceps you should have sometimes if the tip falls off in the chamber, it is a very handy device to just get hold of it and pull it out. And this is a detailed instrument retrieval kit from Dr. Yeshi Karauchi. He doesn't need any introduction. He is leader in this and you have everything that you need for retrieval in this kit but you need the most important thing that is this microscope. Without microscope, you can't use ultrasonics and you can't do retrieval. Let the file be in the pical region or anywhere in the canal. At some moment, you need uh, magnifications. Series. Now research says that ultrasonic instruments with DOM, that is dental operating microscope, the success rate of retrieval is 80 to 95%. Whereas using ultrasonics alone, the success is less than 45%. Immediately we have saw, saw a case. The person attempted a retrieval with a loop and he perforated on the outer wall. This is very important to have high magnification uh, for if you want to do retrieval. Now, file separation is a big, uh, like frustrating experience for any clinician. So we have to see like uh, what all things uh, go for separating a file in the canal. So, it's always good to prevent. There are techniques for retrieval, bypassing everything, but we should think of prevention always. So we have seen that file separation happens mostly narrow or constricted canals. So when I say narrow and constricted canal, mostly it is the mesial anatomies of the lower and the upper molars. And again, in curved canals. So what causes a file to fracture? There are two mechanisms by which a file fractures. One is a torsional failure, another is a cyclic failure. So these two are the basic mechanisms of a file fracture. What are the popular reasons? So multiple use, working in dry canals, forcing the file apically, these all are standard norms. If these are uh, flawed, your file has to fracture, but you may have a bad day or bad luck. It is as, as, bad as that. It happens actually. You take out a new file and it fractures. You are clueless. What happened? So we have few techniques to just guide you like 
how to uh, like even avoid your bad day or bad luck. You can give a bad day or bad luck, a bad day or bad luck. So we'll see that in later part of our uh, presentation now. So how to prevent? So there are a few points you can jot down. This is very important. Never force a file apically. This is a very important point. Never force a file apically. Files are designed to glide by themselves. So never force, especially when I'm talking about this, is the rotary files. With hand files, smaller files, still the number 10. Never use balance force. We have, we, we learned that any hand file use balance force. No. Your small files, 6, 8, and 10, are not designed to take the load of a balance force. So use wiggling motion. I said, what is wiggling motion? It is a to and fro, uh, less than 40 or 50 degree, uh, uh, like um, current clockwise and anti-clockwise motion. So that is wiggling motion. So you have to avoid that, balance force with that. Any file, hand file, above the size of 10, you can go with the balance force technique. Now, with rotaries, you have to use a brushing motion. What is brushing motion? You put the file inside the canal, you feel engagement of the dentine. The moment you feel the engagement, pull it out. So you put the file, feel the engagement, pull it out, clean the fluids, irrigate, put it back. Any canal will not have a failure if you follow this simple technique. Then, Every time you pull out a rotary file, check the file for the length, the flutes, the debris. You have to clean the debris. You have to see for unwinded or rewinded flutes, oppositely winded flutes. You have to see for the length of the file. Suppose when you're using greater temper files, if a small portion from the apical tip fractures, you will immediately appreciate it. But with a small file, say an eight number, or 10 number file of small bit, one or two flutes length fractures, you'll never come to know. So it is very important to check every time you pull a file out of the canal to check for all these criteria. SLA adds to your rotary safety, that is straight line access. Whenever you're using rotary, do have a straight line access that will prevent a lot of your traditional failure cases. Establish a smooth, reproducible glide path. This is again important. In canals over 15 degrees, curve prepare till 2002 with hand files. This is basic. Even if you are like very not very comfortable to use your fingers for that, you can use a M4 safety hand piece. So M4 safety hand piece you can use easily with your hand files. They are designed to take your hand files in there and you can use them just as uh, a rotary file. So. Now, anti-curvature filing by Abu Ross was designed to uh, do the anti-curvature. You, you can just straighten the curve. What you can do, you can use your hand files effectively in a controlled manner to straighten the curve or widen the canal where it is mostly curved. So that prevents the cyclic failure by decreasing the engagement of the file with the critical curved area. So this is another thing you can do. Never work in a dry canal. Always have irrigants in them. So that will reduce the friction also. And also prevent clogging of the flutes uh, with the debris. So this is important. Avoid reusing rotary files. So this is one thing. In many countries, there is a norm. They cannot reuse a rotary file. But in many countries, people reuse it. So when you are using rotary files, you are definitely risking a failure. Checking for the canal diameter is again very important. Before you start a case, check for the diameter of the canal, either it is small, medium, or large. So for a small canal, take a 10 number file. If that goes in the canal with much difficulty, it's considered to be a small canal. Now, if a 10 number file goes easily, but a 15 number file is going with difficulty, considered to be a medium canal. And if a 15 number file is going easily in the canal, it is considered as a wide canal. So how we decide for the medium and narrow canals, prepare them with 4% files only. Don't go beyond 4%. So that will uh, help uh, in preventing separation. Again, one important thing, use manufacturer recommended torque and RPM for rotary files. This is very important. Before we just go to put the file in the canal, we have to know the recommendations at what torque and speed it has to be operated. Use a standard motor where we get reliable torque and speed. 
so someone says this is the talk how you know how you rely on that unless it is a standard uh, thing so you have to use standard things to be sure of uh, the thing again we have to know when we should discard the files now here you see what happens with mostly with the small files so if they fracture a small one one or two fluids length fractures you will never come to know that something is missing unless and until you compare with the same uh, another file side by side so when you keep it you realize okay something is gone small one say less one millimeter thing you will never realize in small files so this is what we see under the magnification but this is when you compare with the file control file you will immediately so this is more specific with the smaller files now you have also to see this deformations you can see the deformations any file when you put it in the canal invariably it gets deformed in the pipal part invariably it gets deformed you have to make out this deform now how the deformation happens unwinding of the fluids then opposite winding of the fluids now till unwinding it is fine but when it starts oppositely winding it fractures up so we have to see once unwinding and any kind of deformation is seen we should discard it hand files definitely should be discarded now with the rotary is what we see you see two basic kind of deformation you can see here in this first one you can see unwinding of the fluids it has become straight okay now here in this image you can see oppositely winding now this is the direction of winding of the file and you see the direction here so it's oppositely winding and if this file is used in the canal it will certainly fracture from here so this things has to be appreciated before you put back that file in the canal now you with this uh, uh, modern metallurgy files rotary files they are softer metal so even they tear off basically they don't break they basically tear off the top part will a bit say one or one and a half or two millimeters will fracture out and again you will not be realizing whether it fractured or not so you have to always see them under magnification and check them so anything has happened or not this is very important now this is a small video we'll be showing you uh, so how to check whether the file is safe to be used in the canal or not so this is a small video just have a look how to check a file before every use what you have to do is just place the file against your nail bed give an acute uh, curvature you can see the second curvature and that acute curvature should be on the tip of the file and rotate it 360 degree like this rotate it 360 degree to and fro to check uh, whether the flexibility exists or not so this most of the time if the file is overused and if it is fatigued, it will fracture off. So even with the newer files, before you place it in the canal, you can just check it like this. Now you see, it has broken. If it is fatigued, it will fracture like this. So this is a very important, you see, it fractured. So this is what happens. With the overworked file, it will always fracture like this. So uh, this presentation is actually uh, in all the parts of the world, wherever there is a tendency or a, like people use reuse files. For them, this is very important. So before putting the file again, just follow this technique. If the file is fatigued, the fatigue here we check is for cyclic fatigue basically. So if the file is fatigued, it will fracture immediately. Also do it for uh, new files also. As I said, you may have a bad day. So just take out the file, check it the same way. So you can give your bad day a bad day. So uh, this can be prevented. Uh, now, we'll know about few medical aspects. So separating a file in a canal is a complication. It's basically not a negligence, but, but we need to have a written consent explaining that when we are going for a root canal treatment what could be the possible complications what could be the possible risks that can happen that is our ethical responsibility so if the doctor informs the patient that a file has fractured something like that it's not a problem now failure to follow these guidelines 
Now, if you follow, if you have not informed the patient regarding the failure or before you have started the case, you have not discussed the probable consequences or risk that could be encountered. So it may land up to somewhere as negligence or malpractice. It's quite relative, basically. The basic idea is to have a good standard of care. That's it. Now, as I come to the end of my uh, presentation, so it had been great uh, sharing with you all. And uh, um, I want to thank my teachers, my colleagues, who have been always been a source of motivation and inspiration, especially uh, I want to take a few names whom I regard a lot. Dr. Samra Tegresar had been handholding me in my UG days. Dr. Mandar Prindrikar and Dr. K. S. Bangasar are really uh, great inspirations. And when we talk about file fracture retrieval topic, then Dr. Yoshi Tarochi needs a special mention. So I thank him for allowing me to share a few parts from his presentations and publications. And uh, it's, uh, he has made this uh, science of instrument retrieval quite predictable and completely uh, scientifically guided. So I owe a lot to people from whom I draw inspiration. So here I come to the end of my presentation. So this is my passion. Uh, nature photography and cycling. I just love them. This lockdown have actually uh, affected us a lot. We are locked up. We are not able to go anywhere. Perhaps now things are easing up here in India. And uh, we had a really bad month, uh, especially the April month. So you can contact me at fde at academy, fd.academy at the red gmail.com. You can log into my Facebook page, the Microscope and Enerontic Training Academy. So thank you all. Uh, you can connect me on Facebook also. Thank you all. Okay, Dr. Banerjee, what a great course. Uh, really, I would like to say thank you because it was a wonderful course. And uh, you are a make me think about the specialist. A specialist is the one who will prove when things don't go as well as we want. And that is the idea of this course. It was a wonderful course. Thank you very much for your presentation. You are doing a great job. And I hope that uh, many people could uh, um, contact you because there is a lot of wisdom in this presentation. Thank you very much. To all the doctors and to uh, who view this video, you can find your C credits on the comment sites of the Facebook. Thank you very much. Have a good day and a great fa a Father's Day also. Thank you, Dr. Julio. It was uh, great of you to host the meeting and to all of uh, uh, who have made this thing possible. Thank you all. Dr. Pavel, Dr. Prashant Basin, Anshul, everyone did a wonderful job. So it was amazing session sharing with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day and good night. Good night. Good day right here. <laughs> Bye.